Welcome everybody to Scaling React Applications. Before I get into the nitty gritty, I just want to kind of see what the audience is made out of. So raise your hand if you've ever tried React, like just like maybe build a Hello World application. Okay, that's like 75% of the audience. Who has used React in production? A few hands go up, like five to 10 maybe? All right, all right. Um, if you've never used React or only barely used React, we're doing a thing called React in Flip Flops um, in February, at the end of February. So we're going to spend a week in Gran Canaria, um, go surfing, both on the web and in the water. Um, and we're going to teach you React for a week. You're going to afterwards come home and be able to build an actual application with it, which is going to be pretty cool. Um, React in Flip Flops, definitely check that out if you want to learn React. So my name is Max. Um, you can tweet any questions, comments, or feedback you have at me at MXSDBR. Um, if you didn't see my talk yesterday, I work as an open source developer at ThinkMill. ThinkMill, we're a full stack JavaScript agency based in Sydney, Australia. I am from Vienna, Austria. Those are not the same thing. Um, two separate countries. We do JavaScript, Node.js on the back end, React and React Native on the front end and the mobile. And since I'm an open source developer, I maintain a bunch of open source projects, some of which you might know. Um, one is Keystone.js, which is the Node.js content management system that we built at ThinkMill. Um, and to build it, we built Elemental UI, which is a React UI library, um, which we use to build the admin interface of Keystone with. And I'm also the creator of React Boilerplate, which is one of the most popular React starter kits you can get at the moment. It has over 10,000 star 10, stars now. And we released version 3 like a few months ago. Um, which was a big launch. And for version 3, we sort of did something very different. Before that, it was just my thing, right? It was, I built a tiny application with React, and I was like, well, i got to do this again. And I just, I'm just setting up the same folders as the last time, so I might as well you know, save that and push it up to GitHub. That was the first version of React Boilerplate. By now, we've talked to hundreds, if not thousands, of developers. It's a team of a dozen people working on it. Um, we really wanted to know how people built their React application, what works and what doesn't. And we tried a bunch of different things. And basically, I want to tell you what we learned and what the patterns are that we now have in there, because they just work. This talk has four parts. The first one is, what is scalability? Because that's a pretty important question when you talk about scaling. The second one is state management. The third one, architecture, which is the meat of the talk. And then we're going to talk a tiny bit about application performance. So what is Scalability, right? That's a good question. When we set out to build the best lead, like the boilerplate to scale the application with, that was the first question we had to answer. What the hell does that even mean? If you look on Wikipedia, you get this sentence. Scalability is the capability of a system to be enlarged in order to accommodate a growing amount of work. Which is a lovely sentence, but I have no fucking clue what that means. Essentially, Scalability is a concept that's arrived from the back end, right? Previously, everything would be done on the server. So you'd have your databases, and if, if you built a new product, you set up your server, your physical server, and you'd connect all the cables and stuff, and then you'd put in like a one terabyte hard drive. And then, you know, your user, users would start rolling in, data would start coming in, and you know, suddenly you ran out of space, so you put in more and more hard drives, and then suddenly you ran out of physical space in your hard drive. Now, that's not a problem today anymore, right? But back then, you had to kind of, you know, build your database in a way from the start that allowed the database to be split across multiple servers, right? Because otherwise, when you run out of physical space, you're going to have a problem, right? If you can't split your database, what are you going to do? So this concept has sort of come, come from the back end and is now very, very relevant in the front end now that we build these rich, interactive front end applications. So what we arrived at is that scalability basically means being able to handle more app users or developers, right? That's the three important parts when you're scaling something, right? You want to be able to handle more application parts. Just because you have a big application shouldn't mean that it's unhandleable, right? Uh, unhandleable, right? The, the code base should, should stay clean and you, know, you should be able to work in it and move forward and be productive. You should be able to have more users, right? Just because suddenly a bajillion people use your app shouldn't mean that everything just comes crashing in your face. That's a pretty bad thing to have. And the third one is, no matter how big your team is, right? No matter if it's one developer or thousands of developers working on the app, it shouldn't be a problem, right? All of them should be able to work independently. They shouldn't be blocked based on the architecture of the code base and that sort of thing. So these three things are really what we focused on and, and what I want to share with you today. So the first thing is state management, right? Since React is a component-based framework, you have this sort of tree of components. This is a very simple tree, right? In a real application, you would have hundreds of nodes. Um, and these are just your components, right? And they're sort of parents around the children. And then somewhere, somewhere, like somewhere very far down, 
somebody types something as an input, and it changes, right? And now you need to propagate that change through your entire application. And if you used Angular 1, for example, you might have done two-way data binding. And with two-way data binding, what happens is that this node at the very bottom goes to its parent, for example, and says, hey, parent, you know, I've changed. And then it might also go to another node and say, hey, you know, you want to you wanna know about this, so, you know, I've changed. And then, but then that might go to its children and say, hey, that thing over there has changed, you know, you might want to do something, and then it goes over there, and then that goes down there, and then that up there, and we, you end up with this mess of state updates, right, where something somewhere changed, you know, some, somebody changed an input, and suddenly your, nav your navigation is expanding, and you're like, what the hell is going on, right? It doesn't make any sense. So instead of doing this two-way data binding thing, when Facebook released React, they released this, um, they also kind of popularized this idea of a unidirectional data flow. So if we take a look at the same, state, uh, the same component tree again, instead of going to the parent, we go to an external entity, right, which is called the store. Now the store, as the name suggests, stores the state, right? That's the whole point of a store. So the input goes to the store and says, hey store, I've changed. My value is now something else. And the store goes, okay, constructs a new state. And then this store goes to a top-level component, right? And then, t and then tells the top-level component, hey, the state has changed. You might want to re-render. And then that component can go and can re-render all of its children, and the changes all propagate in this nice sort of circle-like thing, right? Where an input changes, we go to the store, the, the store updates something, we go to the top-level component, the, our application re-renders. Something changes, we go to the store, it's this nice little cycle going on, where it's very clear why things happen, right? Bugs like, you click on a button and suddenly a user is locked out even though he wanted to lock in or something, it just can't happen anymore because you have a centralized entity where, where it's just, that is the state, the store has the state, it's the truth of the application. Now Facebook released Flux, which was the first sort of implementation of that, and it was based on events. And while the idea was good, it wasn't perfect because events are kind of very hard to test, right? You have to mock them and you have to pretend like events come in, and it was a pain in the ass. So, Dan Abramov went ahead and created a pure version of Flux, which is called Redux, and it's now basically the de facto standard for handling state management in React applications and also Angular applications. There's apparently an Angular version of this, which is pretty cool. Um, so Redux is amazing. It's pure. It's fully functional. So um, everything you do is really easily testable, and you can test how the state mutates and what changes. And then React, because it has this model of a component tree and of re-rendering, it just, you know, you, you just change the top-level node and everything just re-renders, right? It's as easy as that. Now this ties into the architecture though, because if we have these components and these actions and reducers and constants and re Redux stuff, right? How do we handle that? So the first really important thing that we've noticed is that if you have a lot of components, you want to split containers and components. Containers are com React components that care about how things work, right? They solely care about data management, right? They care about, hey, I get some data, I'll reformat it and render some components based on it. And components are com React components that care about how things look, right? So these are your buttons, your sidebars, your you know, modals, those sort of things, which don't have any logic, right? They just render some DOM based on some input, right? They're, they're basically pure, they're just functions. Whereas containers sort of you know, manipulate data and render the right components based on that. And what that gives you is, if you imagine a tree of components, it gives you these layers of data, data management, right? So instead of having to do everything somewhere and like your entire application relies on this one function ma manipulating everything, you just have these intermediary layers that take some data and render the right components based on it. And if your backend developer comes to you and says, hey, we need to change the API format so it's more performant and blah, 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 you can just go into your containers and change how the data is formatted. But if you render the right components, everything will just look the same, right, and work the same. On the other hand, if your designer comes to you and says, hey, we've reskinned the entire application, right? Everything is now laid out a bit differently and the colors are a bit different. You just go into your components, change the styles and everything, you know, the behavior is still there because you haven't changed the containers at all, which is really, really nice to work with, right? It gives you a lot of clarity in your code base. Now, this comes with a certain structure, right? We have these parts. We now have containers and components and actions and reducers and constants. And how do we, how do we group them, right? And traditionally, React applications were grouped by type. Right? What do I mean by that? Well, you'd have something like this, right? You'd have an actions folder and a constants folder and a containers folder. And in this case, we have a navbar container which just has a toggle nav action so we can close and open the navigation bar. And so you'd have all these different files. And if you wanted to add a feature to the navbar, you'd have to dig through six different folders trying to find the right thing, the right styles, but everything is sort of splattered around the application. It's really, really hard to work with, actually. Um, we had this huge discussion 
in the React Boilerplate repo, where I submitted an issue saying, hey, how should we structure version, th version 3 of React Boilerplate? And I didn't think many people were going to respond because everybody does this anyway, right? At the time, I thought this was the non plus ultra. We were going to do this for the next 10 years. And, you know, we got a bunch of su suggestions, and somebody came in and said, why don't you try grouping your files by feature instead? And I went, what? So, what, what, he's, what the person suggested was that we just put all the files related to a container into the same folder, right? So instead of having folders for the types of things that we have, we just have folders for every container and every component, right? So you, you, all the actions of the navbar would be in the same file, or the, the navbar component would, would be in the same folder. If the constants and reducer, everything you need in that one folder. So when you go work with it, you just have to find that one folder, change something there, and look if it's right. And when I first heard this, right, I was like, this, that's bonkers. Why would you ever do that, right? The old way works perfectly fine. Why would we change it? But because I maintain React Boilerplate, I have to try all the things, right? I can't just say, well, that sounds bonkers. Go away, right? I have to actually try things. And so I built like a tiny application with it, right? I planned to spend like 15 minutes with it. And 10 minutes in, building this tiny to-do MVC style demo, I was like, holy cow, I never want to build my applications another way again. Seriously, I was blown away. The productivity that, the, that, that this way of working gives you is immense. So one of the benefits is that you have easy, really easy renaming and moving. That's kind of a tiny side benefit that I've found over time, which is if you import something, and let's say you, your designer comes to you or your product manager comes to you and says, hey, you know, we have a nav bar, we have, but we have too many items, right? We need to add a secondary nav on some pages. And you're like, oh my god, OK. So we're going to rename this nav bar component to primary nav. And then we're just going to have a secondary nav. And if you have different files, right, try doing a global search and replace in your code base. Good luck with that. It's not going to work, right? Because you have so many different ways of doing things, and the files are so scattered around, it's really hard. But because we're importing from container slash navbar slash all the time, we can just search for that and replace it with primary nav. And that's literally it, right? There's nothing more to do. Everything just works. You just rename that one folder, do a global search and replace, and that's it. But that's a tiny side benefit. The much, much bigger benefit is that you're just working in a single folder, right? You no longer dig through six folders with potentially hundreds of files in them, right? Because you have a lot of components. You just find one folder and work within it. And that enables you to build features for, you know, one, one developer can work on the navigation bar, while the other one works on a sidebar, and the third one works on something else, right? And it doesn't matter, right? They're, they're all in different folders. You can never get conflicts, which is amazing. The productivity that I got when I tried this, I was like, whoa, that's amazing. And another thing is that it gives you reusable components. Because now everything related to that component is actually you know, in the same folder. Just push it up to NPM, add some styles in there, and you're good to go, right? If you have multiple apps, you can just NPM install my, my company slash navbar and just use it, right? And that way you can have global, you know, local versioning. You can have semware and all sorts of cool stuff that works really, really well. Now I just said put some styles in there. What about styling, right? We now have put our com component and everything related to it in the single folder, except for the styles, right? We still have a CSS folder. And that felt kind of weird, because when you think about it, if you use a button class, right? If you in your application have a global button class, which styles the button, changing the styles in that button class should not affect anything else, right? That should just affect the button. Right? You don't want to change the background color of the button and suddenly your header is completely laid out wrongly. Right? It doesn't make any sense. If you have a button class, that should only ever be used once. But if we only ever use every class once for every component, why do we have classes at all? Right? Now, this is why we built Styled Components, which is a library that I recently released for styling React apps. And it's a bit bonkers. Fair, like, fair enough, it's, it's, it looks pretty weird. But the thing is, from this styling library, we can enforce the container component split. Right? So we want to split you know, con components that just look like something. They're tiny primitives like buttons, links, that sort of thing. Right? We want to have those text, for example, headings. We want to have those, but they shouldn't have any behavior. And then we want to have bigger actual components, containers, that take some data and render the right small primitives based on that. Right? So we just enforce that from the styling library. What does that look like? This. Now, this looks a bit weird, right? So the first thing we do is we import style from style-components. Nothing fancy going on. But this is where it gets interesting. We say const title equals styled.h1. Now, this styled.h1 is actually a function. And we call that function with a string of CSS, right? 
Now the string of CSS gets passed in, and then this, our title variable here is a React component. So you can now render the title as an actual React component. And it'll work perfectly fine. You can pass in, you know, e everything you pass into this text and into the CSS string will just get applied to the title, right? So, you, so this title, our title component here, will render an H1 tag with a font size of 1.5am. It will be aligned in the center, and it will have a color of pale violet red. Now this weird backtick thing there, I stumbled upon when I first saw this. I was like, style.h1 backtick? How is that a function? Actually, that's an ES6 feature. Um, so you have template literals, right, which are backticks where you have, where, where you have strings, which you can pass interpolations into. But what many people don't know, and I didn't know, is that if you call a function with a backtick, that's calling the function with that string. But contrary to, ju to just passing in a string, it gives us um, all the strings and all the interpolations separately, which enables some nice features which I'll get to very soon. So this is basically calling style.h1 as a function, which returns a React component that's then saved in title, and that will have these styles applied. Our wrapper is pretty much the same thing, right? It'll just render a section tag, and it'll have a color of pale violet red, and be 100% you know, width and height, and have a background of papaya whip and some padding, right? Now, what, what, do we, what, what do we render this like? Well, it's just React components, right? So it's just, you know, we render a wrapper and we render our title. And that's literally it. You can pass in children and whatever you want. And this is what it looks like in the browser, right? We have a wrapper with a not very noticeable papaya with background on this beamer. And our title, which has some text and is in pale violet red. Now, style components, I could give a talk about this for two hours, right? I don't want to bore you to death with it. Um, if you interested, I gave a talk at React Netherlands about it. So just look this up, styling React JS applications at React Netherlands, um, where I sort of go through all the existing React styling methods and explain why we built styled components and how it's different and why it's the way it is, right? Um, so if you're into styling, definitely watch that. So we now have these primitive components that are styled, and we have our containers, and we push them up to NPM, and we can just really easily reuse them. The one thing that always struck me as a bit weird is with data fetching. In the Redux land, what, what most people currently do is use Redux thunk, where you dispatch an action, which is a thunk, which looks something like this, right? You have a fetch data action, and you return another function from there. And, Redux, and the Redux middleware injects that dispatch in there, and you can dispatch actions and do some asynchronous stuff in there, and when you're done, you just dispatch another action. The problem with this is that it's really, really hard to test. Right? Somewhere in the middle of your actions, you just suddenly have this huge blob of asynchronous code that, you'll, I mean, imagine having to unit test that. Good luck. You'll have to mock fetch, and you'll have to mock dispatch, and then you'll, you'll have to compare really with, it's horrible, right? It's just horrible. So the better solution we've found is Redux Saga. Redux Saga uses ES6 generator syntax to give you sort of a separate thread in your application. Not literally a separate thread, but that's my mental model when working with it. So let's take a look at what it looks like, right? So instead of having a, just a function, we have a generator. That's this asterisk up there, right? If you see the function asterisk, that means it's a generator. Now, this has a while true loop. And if you've never seen a generator before, you'd be like, whoa, what's going on here? Stop. What are you doing? Are you crazy? But the thing is, generators completely change the way functions work. Normally in JavaScript, when you have a function, it runs, right? And you can't stop it. And then when it reaches the end, it's done. You know, you might have some callbacks and stuff, which are functions inside functions. But in general, you can't stop a function until you return something or it ends. With generators, that's no longer true, right? We have this yield keyword. And this generator will basically say, OK, I'm going to run, 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 run. Oh, I reach a yield keyword. So let's stop. And then it waits for whatever comes after it to resolve. So take fetch data here is a helper that Redux Saga gives us, which returns a promise that doesn't matter because all we're doing here is we're waiting for the fetch data action to be dispatched. Right? All we care about here is the generator basically goes and says, OK, I'm going to run, run, run. OK, I have to wait. And it waits until the fetch data action comes in. Right? It doesn't do anything. But when that fetch data action comes in, when we dispatch it from anywhere in our application, what happens is this generator goes, oh, the fetch data action has been dispatched. Oh my god, I have to go on. And it goes on to the next step, which in this case is dispatching the data fetching action, right, to show a loading indicator or something. And then we just wait again. And this time we fetch something, you know, we fetch some data, we wait again for it to happen, and the generator doesn't do anything, right? The main application can go on and on and on and do whatever it wants, but our saga just waits, 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 and then as soon as the you know, um, fetching is done, the generator is going to go, oh, the fetching is done. Oh, yeah, I should probably go on. And what it does is the next step is just dispatch an action saying, hey, the data was fetched. And then your store updates and your entire application re-renders. Now, this is nice, right? It's this very nice, if we take a look at the whole thing again, 
it's this very nice, you know, this is all asynchronous code, but compared to the previous, you know, garbage mess of callbacks and stuff, it's, this is actually really, really nice, right? It's, it's kind of like a novel, right? We wait for the fetch data action, and then we dispatch the data fetching action, and then we wait until something is fetched, and then we just dispatch the data fetched action, right? It's really easy to read and really easy to write. But generators are useful for things beyond data fetching. Redux Saga is actually, data fetching is probably my least, my smallest use case for Redux Saga, which is something many people don't realize. Imagine, just as an example, you have a clock component and you have a timer component. Now, when we press start on the clock, we want to start the timer, right? And then when we press stop on the timer, we want to show the clock, uh, we, we want to show the time of the timer on the clock, right? Now, generally, you would do something like this, right? And on the clock, when start is clicked, you would dispatch a start timer action. And with the timer, when stop is clicked, you would dispatch a show time action. The issue here is that you now have these hopefully completely decoupled components, right? You have a clock, which is just, you know, its own component. You have a timer, which is its own component. But by doing this, you've now completely coupled them together. You cannot reuse them anywhere at all, right? You have to use them. Now, what if we instead said, hey, you know, when a clock is clicked, when the start button in the clock is clicked, let's just dispatch a start clicked action, right? And by the timer, and, and on the timer, the exact same thing, except it's a stop clicked action, right? These aren't specific to the clock or the timer, they're just actions, right? And the clock doesn't care about the stop clicked action, the timer doesn't care about the start clicked action, right? They're just actions. And then we use a saga to tie these two components back together, all right? So we have another generator here. And what this does is it, it waits until the start button clicked action comes in. Right? So it doesn't do anything, it starts and then it stops and it doesn't do anything. And then you press the start button on the clock. And what happens is the generator goes, oh, the saga goes, oh, the start button clicked action was called. I need to go on. And it does the next thing, which is dispatching an action saying start the timer. So now we've started the timer based on the start button clicked action without actually tying the two components together. And when, the, when we've done that, we just wait again. Right? We wait, we wait, we wait until the stop button clicked action comes in. And when that happens, we just stop the timer and show the current time on the clock, right? Now, Redux Saga is sort of like a separate thread. And that's because if you take a look at this saga, right, we've, we have two completely decoupled components that do not care about each other at all, right? They don't care about anything. They just care about themselves and nothing else. But the thing is, by tying them back together with the saga, we have this sort of separate thread for asynchronicity asynchronicity. We have our main application thread where all our components are, right? And these two threads sort of just communicate back and forth with actions, right? So our main application goes, hey, the start button was clicked, let's, let's dispatch an action, right? And it doesn't care. It doesn't care anymore. And then our saga thread may or may not go, oh, the start button was clicked, I have to do something, right? And then it does something, and the main application still doesn't care, right? And when it's finished, what it, what it wants to do, it dispatches another action and says, hey, the start button was clicked, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the timer should start. Then it goes to back to your main application thread. And your main application goes, oh, to start, uh, I have to start the timer and start the timer, right? And it's this sort of mental model of having two separate threads in your application. Obviously, JavaScript is single thread, right? Don't get me wrong. But sort of the mental model when working with it is sort of like a separate thread. And it allows us to take those really decoupled components and tie them back together. So a short recap of this admittedly kind of long section. The first thing we talked about is splitting your com components into containers and components. Second thing we talked about is grouping files by feature. The third one, um, using start components to isolate the starting of your components. And then the fourth one, using Redux Saga to tie your now decoupled components back together. Let's talk about performance. Something that many people don't realize is that React is very performant, but it's not very performant if you have a large application for the simple reason that you have a large application, right? You could use whatever you want for that, it would be slow. It's just a large application. So what can we do to change that? Now, if we imagine a component tree again, right? And somewhere, somewhere very, very far down, an input changes, right? So we go to our store, right? And we go to the top level component and tell the top level component to re-render. And what React does is it sort of goes through all the components and goes, hey, re-render everything, right? And then just re-render their children and re-render their children until our entire application has been re-rendered. Now, what makes React performant is that it doesn't re-render to the DOM, right? So React does this re-rendering, but only to a virtual representation of the DOM. And then it sees what the difference is be between what has changed and what is actually in the DOM, and just patches the updates in. 
which is why it's so fast. The problem is that if you have a huge application with hundreds of components rendering on one page, it's still going to be slow to compute um, a virtual re representation, right? It's faster than directly mutating the DOM all the time, but it's still slow, right? If you have a huge application, it's just going to be slow. But it's just this input down there that has changed, right? Why are we re-rendering the whole application? What we actually want to re-render is just this, right? We just want that one branch of our application to re-render, not everything. Just that branch. Why, why does everything else need to care that an input has changed? React allows us to do that with a lifecycle who called should component update. Should component update, if you return false from it, React just doesn't re-render. Now, if you take a look at our component tree, we essentially want to bail out in these components, right? We want to say, hey, and this, this component should say, hey, okay, something's changed, but I don't actually care about it, right? I don't want to re-render myself or my children. And the same goes for that and that component. Now, the thing is, the most performance gains you're going to get from the component over there at the very left, right? Because if that component says, hey, I don't want to re-render, and none of my children sh should re-render either, we basically save half our application from re-rendering, right? That's going to have a huge performance impact. Whereas this one is just one component not re-rendering, well, who cares, right? It's not that important. But if we can bail out up there saying, hey, like, don't react, don't, don't re-render me, I don't care about the data that just changed, that would be amazing. So should component update looks something like this, right? You get, you, you get past the next props. And then you would, what you kind of want to do is you want to return, does do the next props not equal the current props, right? Because if, if the properties of the component have changed, we want to re-render because something might have changed, right? Some rendering might have changed. But if the properties are the same, nothing changes anyway. So why should we re-render, right? It doesn't make any sense. So we want to do this. This is where JavaScript is a bit annoying. Because in JavaScript, if you have two objects with the same contents, you cannot just compare them because we have referential equality. So even though these two objects are the same in the sense that they have the same contents, if you compare them, they're not going to be the same. So you can't just go return this to props does not equal next props because it's always going to be not the same because it's not the same object even though it has the same content. Now what you can do to remedy this situation is loop over every single property and value and compare them, right? You could go, you could loop over all the keys in that object and see, hey, is the value of that key the same as in the other object? And if it is, that's perfectly fine, right? The issue is that deeply comparing objects is really expensive, right? Imagine we, we want to bail up really, really high up in our state tree, right? So we're potentially comparing two huge state trees with lots of nested objects and arrays. Looping over every single property and value is going to take ages, especially if we do it on every single re-render, right? It's just not feasible. This is where immutable JS comes in. Immutable JS gives us immutable data structures in JavaScript. Why is that useful? Well, this is kind of what it looks like. We have this from JS function, and we just say our state is an object which we get from JS. Now, the thing is, this state variable that we have right here, you can now no longer change because it's immutable, right? This state variable here will always, always, always refer to the same object. You cannot edit the username, you cannot add new keys, you cannot add remove, you cannot delete the username. It's always, always, always going to be the same object. What that allows Immutable.js to do is it can compute the hash of the contents of the object, right? So Immutable.js can, at creation time, go in and say, hey, OK, we're creating a new immutable object. Let's just loop over every single property and value and hash them down to a tiny string. And then when you have two immutable objects, all Immutable.js needs to do is just compare two hashes, which are two strings, right? Because the hashes are based on the contents of the object. If the, if the hashes are the same, everything's perfectly fine, right? And that is, they have the same contents because they're based on the contents of the, of the object. If the hashes are not the same, we'll have to re-render because the contents are different. That means suddenly with Immutable.js, you know, if we compare two objects with all equals, deeply comparing objects is really, really, really cheap because we just, we're just comparing two strings, right? We, we take one hash, we take the other hash, we compare them, are they the same or not? Well, re-render or not, right? Like, it's not, we no longer loop over every single thing every single time we render. We just check, we just compare two strings, basically, which is really, really, really fast. So now if we take a look at our component tree again, right, the input has changed, we've gone to the store, and now the top level component re-renders, and it starts re-rendering, but then our component over there can just say, hey, actually, my properties haven't changed, so why am I re-rendering? Let's just not re-render. And it doesn't re-render. And then the same thing for the second one there and for the third one there as well. And suddenly the only part of our application that we've re-rendered is exactly the part that we wanted to. This would give you so much performance, it's incredible. When we tried this on a big application, it went from being unusably slow to speedingly fast just because we, we were not doing all this deep comparison anymore and React didn't have to re-render the whole application every single time. 
So, short summary. What is scalability? Scalability basically just means being able to handle more app, more users, or more developers, right? State management, use a unidirectional data flow library. Um, at the very best, you use Redux because it's pure. Architecture, a bunch of points. Um, you split containers and components, group your files by feature, you use styled components to isolate the styling, and use Redux Saga to tie your decoupled components back together. And then performance, use immutable JS to get deep comparison of your state trees really, really cheaply, and bail out of re-renders for React. Thank you very much, Talin. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. You cannot change an object. No, I mean, you are you're making a change. This means you're creating a new I'm set of the same data. Yes. And you need to recalculate the hash again. Yes, you do need to recalculate the hash when the data changes. That's correct. But um, you're just comparing, like, um, when you change your state, right, which is an immutable object, you're changing one property there, which means you, you need to calculate one hash, and that's it. If you were to do a deep comparison of, on every single component in your state tree, that would take, like, you know, that, that would be the same thing, essentially, except for every single component in your state tree. Does that make sense? So immutable loops over all of your properties and values once and creates a hash based on it, just once for every, you know, state change. Whereas previously, we would loop over every single property and value for every single component in our application. Yeah. The question was, would I use all those modules in a small application? Um, no, I wouldn't. I built, I basically start by just using React, right? I don't even use Redux or anything by default. I just build, if I build something small, I just build it with React. I don't need all of those tools. But it becomes really relevant when you're trying to, so the thing is, it depends on what the goals of your projects are, right? If you just want to build a tiny to-do MVC style demo, right, just don't use any of these tools that you don't want to use, right? Because why? You don't need to. But if you're planning to build a product that should live over the next five years and have a big team of developers working on it, start with the tools from the beginning because it's going to be hard to integrate them later into an already existing big code base. What about the CSS preprocessors using the So the question was, what about CSS preprocessors? Um, Think about the features that you need from a CSS preprocessor, right? So things like variables and mixins, right? Those sort of things. Styled components is just JavaScript. So you have variables, you have functions that re can return more CSS, right? You, you don't need a CS CSS preprocessor because there's nothing to preprocess, right? You just put in JavaScript variables. I didn't want to show, I didn't want to make this a talk about styled components, but um, if you go to the styled components repos, we have tons of demos about how to do all sorts of things that you, you can do with preprocessors, just with JavaScript, right? You don't need to preprocess anything because it's just JavaScript. We do, so we do, oh, sorry, that's a good question. Yes, what about vendor prefixes? We, we vendor prefix your CSS. We take care of that. And we have, so since it's just CSS, right, it's not like CSS in JavaScript where you write your CSS as an object, right? We have, whatever CSS you write in there just works. So media queries, pseudo selectors, whatever you want, we just take that string and put it into the DOM, right? So whatever CSS you want just works, right? So it's not no, it's not inline styles in the sense that we attach styles to the DOM nodes, no. It's an actual CSS style sheet that we inject. Any other questions? Otherwise, you know, let's go to the break. Thank you for having me. <laughs>